And um, I kind of want you to look at some, um, um, point out some things that are covered slightly differently in your textbook and in these slides and kind of explain, and those differences amount to, to a difference of emphasis. And I want you to explain uh, why there is a, this a difference of emphasis. Um, so Newton's laws, and um, it, it, and actually I, it's a very inclusive title because I'm referring both to Newton's laws of motion and Newton's law of gravity. Um, they are both covered in this one uh, set of lecture slides. So uh, Newton's law, there are three Newton's laws of motion and uh, Newton's first law, second law, and third law. And you will see them all covered in the textbook. So under Newton's great synthesis. So that part is not different between me and the textbook. And you can see them all summarized here. And uh, I read the reading and I thought, hey, that's good. That's a good statement. So I used it. Newton's first law, it says every object will continue to be in a state of rest or move at a constant speed in a straight line unless it is compelled to change by an outside force. I thought, hey, that seems fine. So <laughs> that's what you see here. With the emphasis that it's, the emphasis here is that every object continues in its state of motion or non-motion. That um, it, this is a break from, it's a philosophical break from uh, the Aristotelian physics where uh, Aristotle thought every effect has a cause and cause of, uh, if what causes motion is a force. So if there's no force, there's no motion. That's a very intuitive way to think about it. And that's uh, how Aristotle came up with his um, thoughts on nature and it just turned out to be wrong. And realizing this was really something that took centuries. And um, this uh, kind of understanding this, it goes uh, to the time of Galileo. He thought of different scenarios where, um, where this counterintuitive law is actually correct. As in, if you have something that's uh, already moving and you, um, Oh, I had, it in the right. <laughs> had something that's already moving from left to right, and you just don't do anything to it, you just let it be, then it should just continue to move. You, should, you don't need to, something to continue to push to keep it in motion. That it, unless there's an outside force, something that's already moving continues to move at a constant speed in a straight line. And, um, I, and this is where your textbook put, places a slightly different emphasis than what I do. I tied this to principle of relativity because I want you to tie it into uh, Galileo's consideration of uh, his kind of, a, I think it's both a thought experiment and an actual experiment of a ship, um, like being on a ship and kind of doing things on the ship. Like if, when you drop a cannonball, would it depend on if, um, if you are moving or not? And these all relate to the idea of what we call principle of relativity. Um, so, um, so that's what I want you to type to, and that's uh, the emphasis I placed. And the rest of the kind of uh, goes along that line. And uh, your textbook will place a different emphasis. Your textbook ties it to conservation of momentum. And, um, you know, and that's, that's, that's not incorrect. <laughs> um, it, uh, because momentum is defined as mass times of velocity. Well, um, <laughs> momentum is defined as mass times velocity. So um, what your textbook says there is right, because uh, when there's no force acting on an object, the velocity doesn't change. So if a mass doesn't change, then momentum doesn't change either. So you could say that Newton's first law relates to conservation of momentum, that uh, momentum does not change 
unless there's an outside force. It takes outside force to change momentum. It's not wrong. <laughs> um, so when your textbook says the first law is a restatement of conservation of momentum, it's not wrong, <laughs> but it's a slightly different emphasis from the one that I would have put. And it has to do with uh, how you understand the relationship between Newton's second law and Newton's first law. And uh, this is a question I think that comes up more often in a physics class than an astronomy class. And I think that's why the author can get away with that emphasis in an astronomy textbook that he wouldn't be able to get away with a, in a physics textbook is um, when you look at Newton's second law, um, you can kind of see a superficial connection to Newton's first law. So this is how a second law is stated in the textbook. It says, the change of motion of a body is proportional to and in the direction of the force acting on it. And that's a little bit incomplete. That's why you have this parenthesis. Also, it is inversely proportional to the body's mass. The acceleration is inversely proportional to the body's mass. Or you might have seen this phrase or heard of this phrase somewhere, F equals MA. And what that means is net force is mass times acceleration. And that's a bit of, um, um, that kind of puts a cause and effect backward. So the preferred statement of Newton's second law is actually this one. The acceleration is proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass. And um, the Newton's second law, it's a, it, it is a mathematical thing. And I think that's why your textbook kind of states it this way and leaves it there because it's an introductory science class. We are trying to keep math as far away from the class as we can. <laughs> and uh, even though I'm saying that it's mathematical, I'll do my best not to use this equation <laughs> where I don't need to. Um, and uh, what I want you to bring up is what I mentioned here as consistent with the first law. And um, when you spend right amount of time with this question. Uh, this is something that someone somewhere sometimes might think, which is, so is Newton's first law a part of Newton's second law? As in, once you said F equals MA, then do you need Newton's first law? Because once you said this equation, F equals MA, it seems like it's already saying what Newton's first law says, that uh, if the outside force F is equal to zero, then there won't be any change in the state of motion. Acceleration will be zero. So, so, um, so once, so, so is it, does it, so the question to ask is, does it go beyond consistency? Does it, um, actually go to the point where you could say Newton's second law implies Newton's first law. And uh, what I want to say is that the answer there is no. Uh, Newton's first law is necessary separately from Newton's second law. And that's why I want to uh, put Newton's first law in connection with the principle of relativity which it deals what's called the inertial reference frame and how laws of physics are the same for different inertial reference frames, reference frames that are not accelerating. And what's kind of being left out, the nuance <laughs> that's being left out in this one section treatment is that Newton's second law is valid in only limited circumstances, which are inertial reference frames. So if you read a physics textbook, you are going to find this somewhere in your textbook that Newton's first law defines inertial reference frames. Uh, inertial reference frame, reference frame which is not accelerating, are the reference frames where Newton's first law uh, holds valid. And only after you have confirmed that, you can use Newton's second law. So 
and this is kind of a, I guess again, more philosophical issue. And this is something that um, I think uh, I, the earlier you understand about physicists, the more you will get out of it is that um, uh, physics is a reductionist science. Uh, we, our goal is to find fundamental laws of nature and we don't really repeat things. And um, when you have numbered laws and rules, uh, it's kind of, you know, like a seven habits of highly effective people. Why does it have to be seven? Could it be six? Could it be five? Could it be eight? <laughs> Why is it seven? Uh, we live in a world where all those lists of things are often made up. And uh, I think it's uh, easy to import that into thinking about physics and astronomy as in, oh, so Newton's three laws of motion, it didn't really have to be three. It could have been two, it could have been four. And what I want to say is that, yeah, it really had to be three. It, these three are, I mean, maybe they don't all have to be Newton's law, <laughs> but uh, these all three, they don't replicate each other. They are all there because they needed to be there. Uh, if Newton's first law basically said the same thing that Newton's second law says, then you would have gotten rid of it. You wouldn't have kept it around because in physics, we don't repeat things for emphasis. Uh, we leave that to you to <laughs> repeat things for learning. Um, so, the, um, so I really want you to uh, have a place where I can highlight that. That's why the way your textbook treats uh, Newton's first law and second law is different from how these lecture slides um, handle it. Now, the upside of that is, um, so this is a bit weighty, a bit too nuanced, easy to miss, um, is that I don't think it matters too much for the remainder of the <laughs> semester. Um, uh, and uh, 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 things like a third law, I think uh, um, this, uh, by the way, is one where a lot of people often make a mistake. Your textbook does not. Your textbook doesn't just stop at giving you this very confusing phrase. It adds this or phrase, uh, which is what I use because um, uh, when people make a mistake with the Newton's third law, a lot of that kind of comes from this very ancient phrasing that's very unhelpful. <laughs> but so I opted to use this. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this slide in particular, I think has a lot of videos linked. Uh, I recommend that you watch them uh, because this will demonstrate Newton's third law uh, in a way that's clear, not confusing, and is correct. <laughs> um, and but in the end, you know, this is an astronomy class, not a physics class. So except when we need to talk about Newton's third law, I'll be staying away. So you know, like with the rocket proportion, I have to talk about it. But when we are not talking about rocket, I don't really need to bring in Newton's third law. Um, so. Yeah, and uh, I think all of these conserved quantities, angular momentum is the one thing that I so emphasized in the textbook. And I see why, because we're gonna need it when we talk about the solar systems and um, solar systems and galaxies. <laughs> and so, so I uh, took care to include some videos that I had available to kind of explain angular momentum. And that's all linked from the slides. I recommend that you watch them. Um, yeah, and with the universal gravitation, I think it's uh, more or less the same thing. Um, uh, yeah, one difference from your textbook. I was, because uh, once again, we are trying to use as little math as possible in this class. So I was trying to look for an English description of Newton's law of universal gravitation. Uh, your textbook doesn't have it. It just gives you this uh, equation and then kind of leaves it there. So I did my best in trying to come up with this phrasing. Uh, force of gravity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. That's this part. It's a proportional to the product of the masses. That's this part. And um, you may have a homework question or two where you have to plug in numbers. I'll try to give you plenty of hint and help. Uh, the main thing that I want people to understand is the idea of proportionality. Um, so how the force would change with a change of distance. 
and with a change of methods. And I think your textbook also describes that. So that's not really the place where we are different. Um, yeah, and I do mean for too much detail as in you can look at it, but uh, you know, after looking at it, just don't no more look at it, that's fine. Never gonna bring it up again, <laughs> including for more historical reasons. Um, and this uh, links to a website that would be useful if uh, this course were more um, quantitative. But Wolfram Alpha is a wonderful tool. If you've never heard about it, I recommend it for kind of exploring your examples. It's fun. Um, we probably won't be using it all that much in this class because we're trying to stay away from numbers. Um, and I think your textbook doesn't cover it. I needed to mention it because I'm a physicist. <laughs> so I need to tell you where our measurement of G comes from. That it doesn't come from astronomical observation. It comes from experiments on Earth. And this is part of this universality that I'm getting at. The G that we measured on Earth, we assume it's the same G everywhere. It's the same G in Andromeda galaxy. It's the same G in the parts of the universe we can't even see. That's at least what we assume. <laughs> and to the best uh, extent of our knowledge, that assumption has not been proven wrong yet. Um, yeah. So I think the rest. Uh, this, uh, I'll be mentioning this now for later using module six, when we are going to talk a little bit more about general relativity. That's where uh, a principle of equivalence uh, matters. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, kind of everything. I guess I, when I'm doing this um, uh, 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 improv, I don't um, I talk too much. So I think I'm out of time without having gotten to 